Good afternoon, and welcome to River Road Church. My name is Bob Gallagher, and I'm the Minister of Music here at River Road. It's a pleasure to have you coming to hear this, what promises to be a wonderful concert. I've been enjoying listening to their warm-ups and their practicing uh, this afternoon, and I'm really excited for you. When I saw Dr. Lynch a little bit earlier, uh, I said, boy, this, and in front of the choir, I said, this is great, it's like an annual reunion. And he said, Bob, we haven't sung here since before the pandemic. So it's been a little longer than that, but uh, they're so welcome here. They love singing in this beautiful, beautiful building with these fantastic acoustics. And I love the sound of this group, probably anywhere, but especially here, of course. It is a great privilege to have this group here. Please welcome the uh, Washington and Lee University singers, Dr. Shane Lynch.
much. We are so excited to be back here at River Road. It's one of our favorite places in all of Virginia to sing. We've not been here since 2017, which seems so long ago. <laughs> That's right, Legrand was there. Um, <laughs> as we go, we started with Bach, and this is just such a great space to be able to sing Bach. I have my great pleasure to bring one of our choral conducting mentorship students forward for our next piece. We're going to do Mendelssohn's Heilig, which is going to be conducted by senior Michael McLaughlin.
from a tour to uh, Hawaii. Uh, I know, it's, it's rough. Um, for that. And uh, we did many different things, and I'm going to talk about the stuff that we did on the trip and how it correlates to what we're singing for you this afternoon. But one of the things we did while we were there was we tied into the missionary culture that is very much a dominant part of Hawaiian life. And the Hawaiian islands have so many different integral parts from the native Pacific Islanders, from the Japanese influence to the missionary influence. We sang at the Lutheran Church of Honolulu, and my background is in Lutheran choral music, so it just seemed appropriate to start with a set of Lutheran choral favorites. We started with the Bach Motet der Geisthilfe. Bach wrote that for a funeral in 1827 or 1828. It's such an optimistic piece for a funeral motet, but that is really endemic of Bach, who went through so much loss and tragedy in his life. He lost 10 of his 20 children. He lost one of his two wives. Even for the time, that was a lot. Yet his faith remained very deep, and it came across in his music always. He always had this optimistic view on life. We moved from there to Mendelssohn, probably the reason we know Bach today. Mendelssohn found Bach and brought him back. He staged massive performances of Mass in B minor, and you hear Bach's influences in all of Mendelssohn's music. I honestly feel that Mendelssohn is one of our uh, underappreciated 19th century composers because he died so young. Everyone talks about Mozart dying young, but Mendelssohn only lived from 1809 to 1847. He was a very young man when he passed away. We went from there to Paul J. and F. Milius Christiansen's The King of Love and Praise to the Lord. They were father-son, F. Milius being the founder of the St. Olaf Choir, lived from 1871 to 1955. And then Paul J. being one of his two sons who conducted Olaf Christiansen, who conducted it at Oberlin and then eventually St. Olaf, and P.J. who conducted it at Concordia, where I went to school. I had the great fortune of beating P.J. when I was a freshman in college. And then P.J. passed away during my senior year. We were able to sing that lovely setting of The King of Love during his memorial service. It was one of the most moving moments of my life that I have ever had musically. We're gonna move from there into a set that is dominated by pieces that we did in the fall. So in the fall, we were selected, the first American choir ever to compete in the City of Derry International Choir Festival. It was a great honor for us. And they had a very regimented syllabus of things we had to do for the comp competition. And so we took our time and put together some of the pieces for that. The first piece we're going to do is the Sanctus from the Victoria Mass. And this is a shorter Sanctus. We're on a clock in international competitions, and you can't go over time because they start dinging the on points if you go over time. And so we stuck with this shorter Victoria Sanctus. Victoria is an interesting composer for the 16th century. Uh, a lot of people know Palestrina. Palestrina's music is very beautiful. I like to refer to them as flavors of ice cream because Victoria is a little bit more uh, risque. Palestrina is vanilla, and Victoria is more like Neapolitan ice cream. And takes a little fewer chances. We're going to take a very modern approach to the Victoria Sanctus that we will do for you today. Let it be more of a wall of sound coming across normally than the intricate voices that you would hear in the 16th century. We'll follow that up with a piece that I wrote, Laudate Dominum Omnis Gentis. This is a piece that I wrote about 10 years ago. And as we were working through stuff to get ready for the year, it just seemed to fit the personality of this choir pretty well. So we'll sing that one before we go into our third set.
with that because uh, that is called an inverted pedal, uh, which is really just like hazing for the Sopranos, I think, uh, <laughs> for that. Um, the next set we're going to do is our set of uh, music from Hawaii. And during our time there, we wanted to make sure we were not going and just being tourists, okay? Anyone can go and be tourists in Hawaii, and it's actually very problematic because there's a lot of different elements, and the native Hawaiians are not always excited that the tourists are there for very good reason. Hawaii was an independent monarchy that was then overthrown by American business interests in the 1890s. It would be sort of like if Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk got together and decided to take over Costa Rica or something like that today. So it's got a problematic history as we move through things. It's also one of the most underrepresented forms of music and culture in the mainland United States because there's not a lot of people who live on the Hawaiian Islands and it's a long ways away. And so it's very difficult to be able to bring that music back being honoring without being appropriative, being culturally respectful and culturally sensitive, but still being able to share. So we put a lot of effort in our time while we were there of making sure we were meeting and listening to the kapuna, the elders of the society. And they all go, they're lovely names, so it's you meet with Auntie Nola Nuhula, the conductor of the Hawaiian Youth Opera Chorus, who's like the Yoda of Hawaiian choral music. You meet with Auntie Kaleani, who is a Hawaiian linguist and someone who worked with us on hula and the dance movements that went through things. We are not going to hula for you today. <laughs> We were taught it, and then we watched the Hawaiian Youth Opera Chorus do it very well. And we will not attempt to, <laughs> to do that. Um, we worked with Uncle Pili of the Toa Family Luau, who worked with us on all sorts of different uh, things. And I'll talk a little bit more about some of their reaction, the Toa family's reaction. And all of what we did was to try to bring to life the music. The first piece we're going to do for you is called a Mele Ho'okopia, and that is a welcoming chant in Hawaiian culture. The oli, the opening chants that are passed down through familial lines become one of the most important things that are trained in music. And they are all unison, and they are sung without any instruments, and they are signs you exchange oli. They are signs of greeting, they can be signs of sorrow, they can be all sorts of signs of things. We, we're going to do an, an ancient one. But it actually, that didn't work quite right. So actually, Auntie Nola found us one that was written in 2007 and was designed for people from Virginia to be able to sing. And so the first piece that we will do is this Meli Ho Okapia. And this is a welcome. This is a welcome to you. Aloha means so many different things. But one of the biggest things it means is love. It means connection together. And it is our sign of saying to you, we welcome you here. We are so glad you are here listening to us sing. And we share our love with you as we do it. We will go from there into two of the queen's hymns. Queen Liliuokalani was the last monarch of Hawaii. She was overthrown, and then she was locked into her palace, and she was there for several years, and then she finally was let out of her palace, but she was pretty much out of power. She happens to be a choral composer as well. And so learning about the queen's music and the queen's story was one of the most important things we could do while we were there. And singing the queen's music here in Virginia, where it is not heard very often, is so important. The second piece we will do is the Queen's Prayer. She wrote this from her prison cell. It's four verses. She speaks with optimism in that aloha spirit of love. She speaks of the sorrow in verse 2 of her imprisonment, of the loss of her country. Verse 3, she spends time asking for forgiveness and asking for everyone to accept those who have done this to her. We are not going to sing verse 3. That is for her to say, not for us. And verse 4 brings about an optimism towards the end of it. The Queen's music, again, like Bach's, is so optimistic in everything it goes about. And we'll move into a little love song after that, but I'll speak again when we get to that point. Here is our Meli Ho Kapia Lona Ena, and then the Queen's Prayer.
say before, and we were eating at a restaurant in the international market uh, at the beginning of uh, one of our days on it, and the guy who was just managing the area and serving our food asked, he found out we were a choir and asked us to sing, and we sang that for him. And uh, you know, a couple of our singers were like, oh, well, let's sing something else and everything. It actually, his name was Smokey. He had, this is really funny guy. It actually brought him to tears, and he was like, you sing a okay, okay. Yeah, he just couldn't believe it, you know, that anyone would take the bother to learn all of that for his culture. And, you know, just, you know, kind of meant the trip for me. So, this is the Queen's Prayer. Is another one of the Queen Lady Kwaani's pieces. And this is uh, a lovely piece. It is a love story. I think the Queen at heart was a romantic, and she truly felt the spirit of Aloha and brought it into her music. And this is a piece that talks about multiple different aspects of Hawaiian geography, and it ties those into a love story that moves back and forth. And you'll hear the melody interspersed between our parts as we move into that. And anytime they've got one of the melodies, their ultimate goal is to be sharing aloha, sharing love with you. As I had told them all the time, that they have to woo you. And so, you should be prepared to be wooed. And that's the entire point of this piece, is sharing love, sharing companionship, sharing fellowship with our fellow humans through music. This is Imi Awu, the Queen's Love Song.
with a setting of amazing grace. And this ties our two trips this year together. So we started in the fall and we went to Derry, London, Derry, Northern Ireland, which is right on the border between Ireland and Northern Ireland. One of the run-out concerts for the City of Derry International Choir Festival was in Donegal. Donegal is in the Republic of Ireland, and it's right around a little corner, and that corner is called the Amazing Grace Valley. And that is because when John Nestor came around that corner, he was so moved by what he saw, he wrote Amazing Grace. It's stunning. Hawaiian culture likes Amazing Grace as well, uh, because Hawaii is quite stunning. And we were able to find through Auntie Nola an arrangement, a Hawaiian arrangement of Amazing Grace. The text doesn't quite translate, so we don't have the translation in. It does not completely translate to the Amazing Grace. We have the melody, but the text itself is actually talking more about Hawaiian landmarks that tie together, but it also ties back to Donegal. So this is a chance for us to bring both of our moments together in both of our trips. This is Amazing Grace, arranged by Buddy Nalan.
we're going to move into the final set. Uh, we'll start with fire, and I'll come back to that one in a second uh, for that. We will, uh, the second piece we're going to be doing is a piece called The Crossing. The Crossing, written by J. Reese Norris, is a wonderful piece with a text that's quite unusual for choirs to sing. It's about ship faring, but it's not a sea shanty. Um, you know, I guess TikTokers will be disappointed in that. Um, it is a wonderful piece about crossing, about ship faring, but about the art and craft of being out on the sea. And we're doing this piece at a concert in Lexington on March 14th. And that concert is actually part of a larger work that'll be staged with movement called A Hero's Journey. And so we will be using choral music to tell a hero's story, kind of the classic hero's journey, whether it be, you know, Darth Vader and Luke Skywalker or Lord of the Rings or The Hobbit or... I'm a real nerd, so this is like... When they, my conducting students suggested this, it was just like... This is great. This will be the last piece of that concert. So you can even think about it like the end of the Lord of the Rings movies, if you have seen them, at the end of Return of the King, where Frodo finally gets to go across because he cannot stay where he was. His job is done, but he does not get to stay for part of it. Well, that is a classic nod for that. We had to add this one into our program because we were crossing to Hawaii. We were crossing to Ireland. It just was crossing into all of those. And it's just a really great piece. We also get to feature senior Taylor Kalesi on the clarinet during this piece, and he is wonderful. He will collaborate with Dr. Anna Bilius, our collaborative pianist, and the two of them just make the music dance. I will just say, you can come in, it's fine. Uh, I will just say, the, we went on a sunrise breakfast whale watching cruise while we were in Hawaii, which doesn't that sound beautiful and romantic and like a really great trip planner idea? It was really rainy, and I was worried we weren't going to see the sunrise. And you know what? The s winds came in, and they blew out the clouds, and we got to see a glorious sunrise. But the winds also came in and blew up the ocean. And maybe not all of our choir members felt that the sunrise breakfast cruise was the best choice, <laughs> because the seasickness became a real thing. Um, the first piece we're going to do in this set is fire. This piece is also one from that Hero's Journey concert. It's our battle piece during that. So we will have our hero and our villain battling during fire. But my story about this one is actually from our trip. So we were able to work and witness the Toa family luau in the Vimea Valley, which is the north shore of Oahu. And they, it was just this educational, non-kind of touristy luau where they walked through different heritages of Polynesian islands and culture, and they did all things. And they did a haka. If those of you who know what a haka is, a New Zealand war chant that they will do. It was done originally to ward off the other side, but then, of course, the other side was doing it right back at you, so there was a huge battle. And it's now done often by, like, New Zealand rugby and football teams before games. You'll sometimes see um, uh, schools do it when someone is retiring in a real way of honoring we were able to sing for the Toa family after they finished their whole thing for a little bit. And we did fire. And they were so moved by it, they actually gave us the highest honor they could do for us. They took not the show haka that they did, but they took their family haka. And they did their family haka back to us at the end of it. And it was everyone from an 18-month-old little girl all the way up to the oldest elders in the kapuna who did the haka back at us to say how much they appreciated we were there. You're going to understand why they wanted to respond with a haka when you see this. This is fire.
piece. <laughs> this is so great. Um, we're going to pull back to the fall one more time for our next piece. We had the great pleasure of bringing in Stacy Gibbs. Stacy is a Detroit-based composer, one of the foremost composers of spirituals and gospel music in the U.S. He's a very wide-ranging composer. He came to WNL's campus and helped us get ready for the competition in Derry. He helped us work through many of the challenges of performing spirituals and the technical aspects, all of the cultural aspects of doing spirituals. And there's just a lot that we have to unpack and be very very, very mindful of any time we do them. Stacy's guidance as we worked on Ezekiel, which is a double choir spiritual, by the way, um, because he just wanted to make it that much harder for everybody, um, was instrumental. And at the festival, they actually have, they have many awards that they give, and they actually have an award. There's over 600 judged individual choral comp pieces performed at the festival in all of the different eras on them. And the judges pick one piece out of all 600 of them that is deemed to be the best performance of the festival. And we actually won that with our performance of Ezekiel. <laughs> and like I said, I know it's because Mr. Gibbs came and worked with us because he was just magical when he got there. And they, they kind of liked this one too. This is Ezekiel by Stacy Gibbs.
Oh, they have a wireless mic for me, so I never have to worry about picking up the mic, and they just turn it on. I was worried that they're going to leave it on when I like, <laughs> leave the hall, which has happened once. Um, <laughs> we'll close our concert this afternoon with two pieces that are near and dear to this choir. Uh, the first piece is Stephen Paulus's The Road Home. The Road Home is a piece that Steve wrote uh, in the early 2000s. It's by a Michael Dennis Brown poem. Steve Paulus, who's someone who I was able to work with in my younger years, died in 2014 tragically. He was at a 4th of July barbecue and he had a massive aneurysm and he passed away. His music is some of the most evocative and meaningful music I think has been written in American choral culture in the last 75 years. He had a knack for understanding how to paint text to really get inside here in how he put his music together. The Road Home is one of the pieces that really became a traditional thing for this group, not because it's something I chose, but because the members of the choir chose for it to be. Because it meant something to them that they wanted to pass on and to share and to make it something that was a part of generations coming forward. So when we get to these two pieces, we always take a moment to invite our alums, and we actually have quite a few of them in the audience today, to come up and join us on this piece if they would so choose. You're welcome to come. Expect you to be well warmed up. <laughs> the poem speaks to that element of what it is to be human, what it means to share with one another. One of the great things about singing, especially singing in a group setting, is that it gets inside you. We are actually biologically wired to make singing be something that we enjoy. Probably from the earliest time when humans were walking around on this rock, they came together in evenings, in times after the hunt was done, when they would get together, they'd sit around a campfire and they would sing. They would make noise with one another. We've been doing it for thousands of years. And in the process of doing that, it has actually changed how we do, how we feel after we sing, especially after we sing with other people. If you take a group of people who have come from many, many different paths of life, and they're all going crazy, and then they come to a choir rehearsal, and it does not matter the age of the singer, it doesn't matter the caliber of the group, it doesn't matter with any of that. After singing together with another person for an hour, everyone's heartbeat will be synchronized. It is a magical thing, because, of course, that's what our ancestors would have had. That would have been their time of community, of safety, of being able to be with others. I think more than anything, what was lost during the pandemic year was that, that connection, that interplay with other people. And that's why having people come back up to sing this with us means so much. Michael Dennis Brown said it best in his poem for this. There is no such beauty as where you belong. And for all of our singers here, they always belong here. This is The Road Home by Stephen Pollins.
thank you for coming this afternoon and for sharing music with us in this glorious space. Uh, to Dr. Robert Gallagher and everyone here at River Road Church, we are so thankful. We come here as much as we can and we're going to keep coming here as much as we can because it is just a wonderful place to be. We are always so welcomed here and it is so wonderful to share music with you all. We'll close our concert this afternoon as we always do at Washington and Lee with Richmond's own James Erb's arrangement of Shenandoah. Thank you. <laughs>